Hi everyone. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the invitation to come and share with you tonight. Uh, thank you, Rennie and Hawaii Christian Justice, for that really generous um, introduction, and Reverend Kyle, uh, Uncle Chuck, and Church of the Crossroads for opening up this conversation. I think it's a very important and timely conversation that we have. Kathy Ferguson and Phyllis Turnbull, um, professors from the University of Hawaii, describe the U.S. military in Hawaii as being um, everywhere and yet hidden in plain sight. And that's one of the contradictions that we've tried to wrestle with in our work at the American Friends Service Committee and also Hawaii Peace and Justice, is how do we make it visible? How do we make the violence that's sort of hidden right in front of us visible so that, you know, you know not to, not to tra traumatize or re-traumatize ourselves or each other, but to start working for solutions and for an alternative, you know, a better way of living and being with each other in the world. So that's the sort of spirit that um, I approach this uh, issue. Um, and, and before I, I get into it, I just wanted to um, share uh, the Hawaiian concept of um, kavama hope. in the past is the future. So Hawaiians are always mindful of history and, and how that history kind of um, is unfolding in, in, in our present and into the future. So it's not a, you know, the present is not just this instantaneous point in time, but it, it really connects to the distant past and it connects generations into the future. And so it, it has, it kind of demands of us a kind of ethical uh, conduct and responsibility for um, taking care of, of the legacy of the past and also being mindful of the legacy we leave for the future. And I think that understanding militarization in Hawaii and the kinds of issues and conflicts it brings up uh, requires of us to have that historical perspective. We can't just um, deal with cons um, uh, the uh, symptoms that are emerging at this time. So, um, next slide, please. So, um, the Native Hawaiian uh, historian David Malo, uh, he wrote a letter to the Hawaiian uh, region, Kina'u, in 1837, um, and this this uh, is a famous quote, when the high tide rises, large fish will come from the dark ocean, from places you have not seen before, and when they see the small fish of the Seattle place, they will eat the small fish. And it was, a, it was about a particular incident, but it had become this kind of prophetic statement about um, the, the tragic sort of realities that have unfolded in Hawaii and in many parts of the Pacific. He was describing imperialism. Um, and, and he was a, a person who studied history and he, he knew Hawaiian history as well and he was sort of using a metaphor that would communicate the urgency of the situation. So, next slide, please. So who are the big fish that he was concerned about? Well, this is, this is one sort of um, messenger of that, of that sort of uh, trajectory. It was was uh, Indiana Senator Beveridge. The Pacific is our ocean. The power that rules the Pacific is the power that rules the world. That power is and will forever be the American Republic. So this just sort of epitomizes the vision that was being projected, right? This was uh, 1900. So the, the, the U.S. has been expanding across the American continent, uh, you know, uh, fighting Indian wars, uh, fought the war with Mexico, acquiring new territories and reached the Pacific coast. And there was a kind of a crisis of identity that was happening, I think, that the economics were, were going up and down and people were not sure, you know, is the United States going to survive this? Is the, can it continue to grow without expanding territory? And so across the Pacific was China. Uh, the, the other European countries were already carving up their piece of, of that um, you know, body that they saw, and the United States wanted access, but they needed a way to get across. So this was the sort of vision that was being projected, the big fish. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, President Roosevelt, when um, he was still the Secretary of Navy under McKinley, uh, he was an avid um, disciple of Alfred Mahan. Uh, you may recall he was the, the captain who um, was a great theorist of naval sea power. And he said, you know, that all the great empires of the world have utilized the sea as a way to uh, dominate and because they control all the commerce and, and trade. Um, and so um, in 1905, after he became president, Roosevelt said, our future history will be more determined by our position on the Pacific facing China than by our position on the Atlantic facing Europe. 
And so soon after he came uh, to power, uh, he organized uh, this map, I'm sorry, the slide's not really showing up very well. He organized um, what's been called the Imperial Cruise. It was a, a cruise ship that went from San Francisco to Hawaii, to Japan, China, the Philippines, Korea, and then back. It was led by William Taft, who was the Secretary of War at that time. Uh, there were about 23 senators and congresspersons on board. It was one of the largest diplomatic missions ever to be sent out. And um, also, uh, Roosevelt's daughter Alice was on this um, cruise. She was uh, sort of the Paris Hilton of her time, very uh, uh, celebrity. So the media was always flocking to their, you know, uh, and, and covering their, their adventure. Um, and you know, she wondered, well, how come when I come to Hawaii, you know, it's a beautiful place, but people aren't welcoming us here? You know, this was uh, what a few years after uh, the overthrow and the annexation, and. Uh, it was after uh, the U.S. defeated Spain in the Spanish-American War and then had pretty much put down a lot of the Philippines um, uh, revolutionary movement after that. And so you could see it as a sort of a geopolitical survey of the newly acquired colonies and then um, also an expedition to scope out what, what resources and, and uh, the politics were in these other areas. One, one thing that um, I learned in this book, and I, I need to study it more, but when um, Taft went to Korea, he assured the king of Korea that America is your friend and we will stand by you. We will defend your sovereignty because Korea was afraid of being swallowed up by Japan. Right? As, after uh, Taft went to Japan and met with the Japanese Prime Minister Katsura, uh, they had a gentleman's agreement, a, a, an informal agreement, not a, not a formal treaty, that basically said if Japan would be okay with the United States having colonies in Hawaii and Guam and, and uh, the Philippines uh, and in return the U.S. would be okay with Japan um, colonizing or uh, where was uh, asserting its suzerainty over Korea, basically annexing Korea. And so a few years later that happened and it sort of set in motion these two trajectories of, of imperialism, American and Japanese, that, that you, know, you could see it as a collision that happened at World War II. So some of those contradictions were starting to come out at this time. Uh, next slide, please. And that was called the Taft Katsura Agreement, if anyone's interested in looking at that. It's very interesting. Um, when uh, President Obama was elected and Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State, she embarked on an um, imperial cruise of her own. Instead, sort of breaking from tradition, right, because uh, when a new Secretary of State comes into power, the first act is usually to, uh, internationally, is to go to Europe and meet with uh, all those uh, countries. Uh, she broke the tradition and went to Asia as her first international trip. Um, and um, so it was, it was sort of like scoping out, this is the new terrain. And then last year, she wrote this influential article in uh, Foreign Policy, America's Pacific Century. So it, it, you see the echoes of the past in, in what she's writing. But one thing that I, I underline here is how um, the US the United States will pursue a more geographically distributed, operationally resilient, and politically sustainable force posture. So, you know, keep that in mind in terms of like what are some of the issues that are happening around military bases, military movement um, in, in the region. They're trying to balance these different um, these different factors in order to maintain that geographic reach. Next slide, please. So, um, when they talk about a pivot. A pivot always requires a uh, point on which to balance or, or to turn. Uh, it's called a fulcrum, right? So a mechanic, the fulcrum is that point of rest that allows you to leverage. Um, and uh, Ar Archimedes, the um, um, Greek philosopher, mathematician, said, give me a place to stand and I will move the earth. So it's using mechanics to assert, you know, apply a little bit of force in one end, and on the other end you have much greater force to move objects. So I, I would argue that Hawaii is that place to stand for uh, the United States to leverage its power across the Pacific and into other people's regions. Um, and we continue to play a role uh, like that. So if we want to start thinking about you know, how, how do we build a different kind of order for peace, we have to address some of that role that we, we play today. So next slide, please. And so how do we get to be that? Uh, this is a... Um, picture of uh, General John Schofield. In uh, 1872 and 1873, uh, he came to Hawaii uh, as a tourist, but that was the official story that they gave. But it was really a, um, uh, a, a scouting mission for the U.S. military. They were writing back secret dispatches. 
uh, General Alexander, Bertin Alexander was also on this uh, group, this uh, tour. And you see them here, um, it looks like this is up in the Wai'anae Range probably, um, uh, surveying the land. Uh, he wrote back, the Pearl Lagoon is the key to the Central Pacific Ocean. It is the gem of these islands. So kind of, you know, it, that's where their gaze has locked onto and, and that's where their plans are now centered around. Um, this wasn't the first time, but it was, it was a very influential moment when uh, Schofield came to Hawaii. Next slide, please. And so how did that happen? Um, in it, sugar was just becoming um, uh, a, a, a major uh, economic force in Hawaii. Uh, they had all this product that they needed to sell to the American market, but the uh, tariffs made it prohibitive. And so it, the, the sugar planters, who were mainly you know, the, the, the white um, elites in Hawaii, were pressuring the king, we need to sign a treaty with the United States, a free trade agreement that would allow uh, the tariff to be lowered and Hawaiian sugar can go into the U.S. market. In exchange, the United States wanted access to Pearl Harbor. But at, at the time when Kalakaua was first installed in 1875, uh, it was a very unpopular idea among the Hawaiian people. And so um, he agreed on a treaty that didn't uh, grant access to, to Pearl Harbor, um, the first treaty of reciprocity passed. Ten years later, when it's supposed to be renewed, uh, now the United States inserted a clause that said it, it's going to be exclusive access for the United States in Pearl Harbor. And that was, like, it, it was political fireworks because the Hawaiian people were very much against losing their sovereignty, losing control over a key resource like Pu'uloa, Pearl Harbor. And so um, uh, it was threatening, it, it actually held up the ratification of that second treaty uh, for many years. And so what happened, um, the, the, the sugar planters, the, the elites, a stage coup d'etat, right? That's the first act of the takeover. It was called the Bayonet Constitution. At, th at the threat of force, uh, they had the king sign a new constitution, and this constitution radically changed uh, politics in Hawaii. It, it uh, created property and wealth requirements in order to vote, and it also put racial uh, limitations on who could naturalize into the Hawaiian kingdom. So if you're a Hawaiian or you're European or American and you had property, you met the property requirements, you could vote. Uh, if you're a native Hawaiian and you didn't have enough wealth or land, you were disenfranchised. So that changed things dramatically. Uh, if you were Japanese or Chinese, you couldn't naturalize because you were of an of a undesirable race. And so um, we were not incorporated into the polity. And so the power shifted dramatically as a result of the Bayonet Constitution. And one of the first acts was to ratify the second Treaty of Reciprocity. So free trade and militarization are already sort of mixing and, and weaving its web for Hawaii. Next page, uh, please. So what was it all about? At least in the minds of the Navy, Kiawalao of Pu'uloa, the many bays of Pu'uloa was um, what they saw as the, as the ideal uh, naval base. Um, but this is a, a kind of a romanticized image, a painting from 19, 1898. Um, but it gives you an indication of how it might have looked without all the industrial development. It was a very productive fishery. And um, it, was a, it was considered the food basket of Oahu. Some people say there's like 36 fish ponds in that, in that area. Um, and there's also a very important female place. The, the chiefs who created the fish ponds were female chiefs of Oahu. Uh, the, the two of the major uh, guardian deities for Pu'uloa were female, the, the Mo'o Wahine, uh, Kanikua'ana, and the um, shark goddess uh, Ka'ahu Pahau. So, it, 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 and if you, if you kind of consider the geography and its, and its sort of its productivity, it, it sort of fits in a way about why that was an important element. Next slide, please. And um, again, this is um, just to give you an indication of the sort of unique geography of the area. It drains two mountain ranges. So there's 12 ahupua'a feeding into Kiawala Ahupua'a. All those streams, the mixing of fresh water are, you know, as some of you may know, is estuaries are very rich uh, for biodiversity. Uh, there's a lot of food, um, there's a lot of habitat, and so um, Kiawala Ahupua'a was a nursery for many, many fish species, including the ocean-going mullet, the anai, that would go out and swim around, migrate around the islands. Um, it was also abundant with pipi and uh, oysters and crab and shrimp and other things. 
Uh, the next slide, please. Oh. No, no, the color went away. <laughs> Weird. Okay. Um, anyway, um, this one, you can see some of the fish ponds I tried to reconstruct from old maps. So um, over on the Whitefield Peninsula where the, where the soccer stadium is now, soccer fields, um, is those big fish ponds. Those are hundreds of acres. Uh, Manana, the Pro City Peninsula, all the way around the, the edge by IAEA, and down here by where the airport is now. There's some big fish ponds. Uh, it's much easier to see in color, I'm sorry about that. And also the shoreline um, has changed. Could you go back one? Yeah. The, the green shoreline it was, the, was the old shoreline. And then you see some of the wetlands there. Those are all areas where fresh water is percolating up. So um, because of all the groundwater, because of the geography, uh, it's, it's rich, it's, wide, it's got lots of water. And so if you look at some of the names, it gives you an indication, yeah? Waimalu, Waimano, Waiau, uh, all water names. Um, and so all of, lots of that have been filled up, but there's still water coming out. In um, many, many places, there's still water. The, the Watercrest Farm, um, Sumida Watercrest, when you went on Pro City, that's one of the old springs that are still, still coming out. Um, okay, next. Two, can you know, two? And so the, um, the PP, the Hawaiian Pearl Oyster, is um, what Pearl Harbor is named for. It was so abundant that um, Hawaiians would, were eating the, the flesh of the, of the pearl oyster. It wasn't for the pearl so much, but also the shell was really valuable for um, making uh, fish hooks and, and lures and um, the eyes for sculptures and artwork and things like that because of its luminescence. Uh, they, the biologists haven't found a live pearl oyster in the last 20 years or so that they've looked for it. They, they, but you can find layers of the shells, the fossil shells, along the shoreline if you go. There's still big ones buried in the mud to give you an idea of how much there was. So it's, it's changed. Next slide, please. And um, Leilani Basham, an instructor, a professor at uh, UH West, West Oahu, has been doing research in old Hawaiian newspapers and, and is pulling out stories more or level about the Hawaiian uh, wahipana, the historic places. Um, this one is about is from the Mo'olelo Ka'au no um, Ke'au Mele Mele. And it talks about, in you know, this period of time when Hawaiians were dying from disease, the fish also began to disappear. Can, and next one. Um, actually, could you go ahead to just something? Um, so this is the translation of it. Um, the, the story continues that at the time that these oysters disappeared, a white, jagged, serrated object grew in all the places on the ocean side of Elba. And the people of Elba named this object a pahikawa, which is a sharp pointed thing. It's a, they were using a metaphor of another kind of shell, like an alien shellfish that was kind of creeping in, and then all the native shellfish disappeared at that time. And the story is that um, ka, uh, Kanekua'ana, because the people were not Pono, they weren't just in their dealings with the land and with each other, took all the fish and, and left, and this came in its place. Slide. So back to the, the, the history of the, of the takeover. Um, after the, the Bayonet Constitution um, and Kalakaua passed away, Queen Lilio Kalani, one of her first acts was to try to restore the rights that were lost under the Bayonet Constitution. And so that's what triggers the U.S. Um, Minister Stevens to land troops in Honolulu Harbor, march them up Mililani Street and point their Gatling guns at Yolani Palace. That becomes the, the muscle that enables a small group of white settlers to overthrow the queen. Um, so this was the, the break, I guess you could say, in the relationship between Hawaii and the United States. Up until that point, there had still been treaties of friendship and, and commerce that, that you know, they, they tried to adhere to, and that was what the queen was appealing to by saying, I'm going to yield to the United States because I don't believe, you know, you as a great country are going to do this to us, right? Um, and you will restore me to my rightful place once you realize the error. Um, unfortunately, President Cleveland was not able to enact that restoration. Right? Next slide. And so the, the dismemberment of the Lahui happens in, in sequence. So uh, the, the, the Republic of Hawaii that's declared uh, tries to um, get a treaty of annexation in 1895. Uh, President Cleveland does not put it up for ratification because after he's sending Commissioner Blount to investigate, realizes it's not a legitimate revolution, the people do not support this new government, uh, we should restore the Queen. 
So no Treaty of Annexation the first time around. After McKinley is elected, they try it again. So the second Treaty of Annexation makes it all the way to the U.S. Congress. Um, but Hawaiians are now organized, so the Ku'e petitions are circulating the islands by canoe, by donkey, however it took to get around and get signatures. And just overwhelming majority of Hawaiian, Native Hawaiians and ho other Hawaiian citizens uh, signed the petitions against annexation. Those were delivered to Congress and they defeated the second treaty of annexation. This is one of the great lies that at least I was taught growing up here, right? That annexation happened, it was uh, Hawaiians uh, willingly joined the United States. And if you go to McKinley High School, his great, the great lawn with that statue, right? He's holding a treaty of, of annexation, which there were, never was one. So, uh, you know, this is, um, this is how deep this stuff goes, and, you know. Uh, anyway, um, but the, without a treaty, it's hard, you can't annex a sovereign territory, much less a sovereign country, right? But the Spanish-American War in 1898 becomes the trigger. So, do you see this pattern that happens over and over? Whenever the United States goes to war, more Hawaiian land gets taken. And that was the, the beginning of the full-scale full occupation. Um, and that's another, you know, I'm not going to go into it too much, but the 1959 statehood was put forward in a way of, of, of a part of the process of colonization, decolonization that was happening after World War II. But it was done in such a way where the, the U.S. settlers in Hawaii get to vote, which is kind of against the whole principle of self-determination. And when UN laws or uh, protocols for decolonization are set up a few years after Hawaii gets incorporated, um, it, it says that you know the, the self who gets to determine have to be the colonized people, right? That's the basic principle. And 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 the uh, options of independence, uh, commonwealth, or, or free association, and um, and of incorporation have to be offered. Hawaii only had one option offered. So there are many problems with that process, but we were incorporated into the United States at that point. Okay, next slide. Um, oh, color doesn't come out. Wow. That, um, that box that kind of bounds the, the middle part is um, the uh, area of responsibility for the U.S. Pacific Command um, centered in Hawaii. So it's um, the largest and the oldest of the U.S. Um, uh, unified commands. Uh, most of the world's population lives within its area of responsibility. Uh, ha over half the surface of the planet comes under its domain. It goes from Alaska to an in and includes an Antarctica uh, from the west coast of North America to the central Indian Ocean. Um, and so this is what has resulted, I, I would say, from um, the events that happened in Hawaii. Next slide, please. Sorry that slide didn't come out. So, um, <laughs> our um, a friend, Kalei uh, Koa Kaeo, he's a, a Hawaiian activist and a, a cultural practitioner and scholar on Maui. Uh, he, he teaches at um, UH Maui. Um, coined this expression of the he, octopus. We were in, uh, in Tonga for the uh, Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific Conference in 2003, yeah, 2003. And he was giving the report on Hawaii, but he used the metaphor that Hawaii is the head of this monstrous he that's grabbing at the Pacific. The, 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 the picture actually, this is kind of funny, it comes from, uh, I think, a U.S. propaganda against Japan during World War II. But some artists did this and I just found it on the internet and I thought it was funny. One thing I want to say is like, I don't want to give Te'e a bad rap because they're really intelligent, <laughs> they're, 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 they're gentle, they're, they're, you know, um, and they're, they're also um, seen as Kinulao, they're very powerful, right, spiritually. So they're Kinulao of Kanaloa, the god of the sea, they, they have many good qualities too, but I guess the idea is that when, when nature goes astray, you kind of create monstrosity that can be dangerous, can be a threat. So we have something that's gone astray. Next slide. And so this is what it sort of looks like on the, on, or from the air, I guess, not on the ground. But um, the military occupied land in Hawaii is about 230,000 acres. Um, Hawaii Island has this huge area that's about 133,000 acres of land in the center, center part at Pohokuloa that's um, a military uh, training area. But um, it goes all the way from uh, Kauai, I think there's some radar stations on Niihau. Uh, you can't see Kaula Rock, which is just south of Niihau, but that still uses a bombing range, uh, Kaula. Uh, Kahoalawe and uh, these other areas that are kind of colored sort of a brownish-orange in this slide. <laughs> 
Um, those are the former uh, military lands in Hawaii. So there's hundreds of thousands of acres of that that's, that's still contaminated. Um, for example, you see the orange uh, on Hawaii Island towards the coast by Kohala, right? That goes down to Kauai High, includes Waikolo Village, uh, Waimea Town. Uh, that was a, a training area during World War II, and it's 110,000 acres that they're still removing ordnance. It's gonna, it's gonna take over 100 years at the rate that they're going, and, and right now the, the cost is about 700 million dollars, which is 300 million more than Kahoolawe. It's also four times the size of Kahoolawe. So we have a lot of problems, and they just expanded in those yellow areas. So that's the striker brigade expansion areas that you see there, 25,000 acres, or 23,000 on Hawaii Island, about 2,000 on Oahu. Can you go to the next slide, please? We'll zoom in on Oahu. So Oahu, yeah, Oahu poor thing. Us, um, we, we get, uh, you know, a lot of the of it is concentrated here. And so the, my latest calculation is that 24.6% uh, of the island is um, uh, controlled by the U.S. military. Um, the red areas uh, from Mokapu and uh, Bellows and on the east side to Kiawalao Pu'uloa on the central. And then you have that vast area of uh, the Ko'olau, um, Kahuku training area, the Ko'olau training area. Schofield goes from the Ko'olau all the way across to uh, the Wainai Range. Uh, and then Lululele in Wainai Valley, I mean uh, Lululele Valley on the Wainai side of the mountain. And then Mako Valley, uh, just a little north of that. But um, that's almost comparable to military land percentages on Okinawa and Guam. They, they have a little bit higher, about 30% in both of those places. But this is a pretty high percentage. You don't see any other uh, state or, or other places around that, that have this high percentage of military land. But you wouldn't sort of notice it, right? I mean, you drive by the mountain, it's beautiful, but it's, it's all training area. So, okay. Next slide, please. Um, oh, it's so terrible, too. Okay, so you see the square around the island. Our, our entire main island chain is surrounded by uh, military um, uh, maneuver areas. It's a, a defensive sea area. And then those other zones that go out, those arcs are for um, where they fire missiles and where they shoot, they do live training. Um, there's little zones around Pohakuloa and parts of Oahu where there's, there should be a red, um, red little um, outlines. Those are the controlled airspace over parts of the island. Um, and then if you notice, Kauai is just surrounded. So everything from the Pacific Missile Range out there is all where they do a lot of the RIMPAC training. But it's, just, it's that area where you know, they're firing missiles and doing missile defense tests. Um, and then you can see Kaula Rock is that little circle off of Niihau at the bottom. Uh, it's surrounded by controlled airspace and a, and a training range. So that's still, it's a bird sanctuary, but it's still being used as a live fire. Next slide, please. And then um, this is uh, the temporary operating area that goes all the way, it includes all of the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, Papahanao, Mokuakea, um, as well as the main islands. Um, so the, the, the Hawaiian uh, Marine Monument is included in this area. It has, you know, it, it instituted protections for the marine life. Um, but it has an exemption for the military built into its very constitution. Um, so this is actually a new model that's happening. The same thing was, was imposed in, in the Marianas Marine Monument. And then Britain did the same thing in the Chagos Peninsula uh, archipelago uh, in the Indian Ocean. And so as a way of keeping people out in order to have uh, open space for military maneuvers. Well, look how big that is. Huh? <laughs> So um, there's, uh, according to the base structure report, 2011, 118 U.S. military bases in Hawaii, or installations, right? Everything from really small to the large bases. A number fluctuates from year to year, and I don't know what to account, how, how to account for that. Uh, it, it might be just an accounting thing where they, they count certain bases in different ways from year to year, but that was the latest count. Um, and we're also, the, this is the logo for the Pacific Command, but I thought, um, if you could hit the next slide. It just struck me how similar that logo was to this cartoon from 1898, uh, 10,000 miles from tip to tip. So that was at the height of kind of the U.S. Uh, imperial expansion. It's the eagle going from Puerto Rico and Cuba all the way to Guam and the Philippines. Okay, next slide. 
So the brains of the Hei, the fiber optic nervous system, the supercomputers in Maui and up at the uh, Pacific Command headquarters in Halawa Heights. This is the com one of their command centers there. This would be the, the brains and it's, and it's quite extensive. Um, this computer bank down here is, is in Maui, that's in Hei. Uh, next slide. Uh, the eyes of the Hei. Up on our mountaintops, there's a lot of these military tracking radar stations. So Haleakala has the AMIS facility. It's an optical tracking station for missile defense tests. When they shoot a, a launch from Vandenberg over the Pacific towards Kwajalein, that um, beam picks it up and it's an optical tracking. So it's picking it up over the islands. Um, the other one down on the lower right, that's in Kaena Point. They have tracking station there for the Air Force and also missile defense. So they pick it up over the horizon and are also tracking and giving telemetry to the, the that warhead. Uh, the one on the top right is up in Koke, up in the up in the forest there. And you've probably all seen the golf ball, floating golf ball mm -hmm. on the harm. So that's the movable eye. Next slide. It's, a, it's called a sea-based X-band radar. It's part of missile defense. Um, and then the ears of the hay. So these radar, radar dishes are up at um, um, Whitmore uh, at the NC TAMS, the Naval Communication Master Center. It's, it's, a, it's a newly expanded facility. They put a lot of money into um, expanding it, building down into the mountain. Uh, and they're going to consolidate a lot of the different intelligence gathering um, uh, branches in one complex. So the NSA, the National Security Agency, uh, has a facility right now in Kunia. If you drive down Kunia Road and you see this kind of hardened facility that's sort of dug into the into the pineapple field with some red red dark dishes sticking up in the pineapple field, uh, that is from the World War II era. It's going to move and consolidate with this one. So um, NSA, by the, I mean they're the ones listening to your cell phone calls, right? So they're scanning all the all the bandwidth um, as part of the the global echelon network that that is tracking communications. Uh, this other thing is, a, is a, a sonar array on the bottom of the ocean off of Kauai. That's the north shore of Kauai. And so they, they have these listening devices all over the bottom. And so when the ships are moving, you can sort of, I guess, track them you know, on, on the computer. Uh, the tentacles uh, go to Okinawa. That's uh, Ginoan City Futema Air, um, Air Station. And you can see how densely populated it is and why people are so upset about the noise, the accidents. Crimes. Um, so, because of protests in Okinawa, the proposal was to bring 9,000 troops plus their dependents to Guam. And this is um, Opera Harbor, uh, and that, that expansion would have been just ca catastrophic. It would have, uh, with all the workers that would come with this expansion, increased the population by like 30% with some estimates, right? And that, you know, just, just imagine as, as, a, as tomorrow people native to that land. Having your population explode in that way would be just a political nightmare to try to um, have some uh, some determination over your affairs. In the Marshall Islands, um, you know, n not even considering the 67 nuclear tests that were done there and the nuclear um, effects on the people, but the Kwajalein Atoll has been turned into the premier um, testing facility, the Ronald Reagan Missile Defense Test Site. So the, the launches from Vandenberg land in the lagoon in Kwajalein. The people of that area, except for the landlords who get paid from the U.S., the US uh, most of the people were, were crowded into Ibai, a, a little island that's um, like just terrible, terrible conditions. Uh, and then over in Co uh, Korea, this is in Pyeongtaek, a little farming village just outside of an army base that where, um, because of the U.S. realignment in Asia, they were going to expand the base and they, they evicted the whole village and just destroyed their farms. So this, this was several years of struggle, and this is when the police came in and just started you know, moving people out. Very violent. They, they, they lost that struggle. Uh, you know, the base uh, we evicted them, but one thing the activists said, which was really amazing, is that you know, we, we, we saved our community. But because they struggled, their relationships were maintained. If they let it go, they would be scattered. Right? So that was something that was really profound. Um, but the tentacles can grow back, right? So the Philippines um, pushed out the U.S. bases in 1989, Subic Bay, Clark Air Base. Uh, but then soon after September 11, uh, the U.S. was uh, bringing special forces into Mindanao to uh, do training for the Philippines military against Abu Sayyaf, right? Terrorists. 
Um, and so that's that's over in Mindanao, these troops there. Um, this is Subic Bay, one of, was once one of the premier military bases uh, outside of the U.S. Um, and then some protests, but also the, the violence against women and the, and the sexual exploitation that goes on with the military in, as an industry, right, as a, as a uh, customer. So, next one. Um, and uh, the excrement from this um, pe'e, this octopus, can be symbolized by what became of Kiabula or Pu'uloa, is now a giant Superfund site. The Navy, um, one of their lists had about 748 sites that they were investigating for contamination. Everything from PCB and mercury to the radioactive cobalt-60 comes out of the um, uh, nuclear submarines when they flush the cooling system. Some of that stuff goes into the sediment. Um, and perchloroethylene is a solvent used to strip motor parts and dry cleaning. Uh, if you go by IA Elementary School right across the street, there's a, there's a um, paved area that's enclosed in a fence. Uh, that was where there was a facility that leaked diesel fuel and, and this uh, perchloroethylene solvent. So the diesel, they've been able to tap and they're pumping it out and trying to extract it. The perchloroethylene hit the groundwater and just took off and so it's coming out at the edge of IA Bay. They're, they're getting detects in the water, but they, they're, they can't do anything about it. So the remedy is called monitored natural attenuation. So they look and do nothing. Um, so some of the impacts, I'll go just quickly, the loss of independence and sovereignty, self-determination, the taking of the land and displacement of people, uh, the environmental impacts, contamination and endangered species, um, and then some of the economic and social impacts, crime, uh, prostitution, um, uh, competition for housing and jobs, uh, as well as a kind of a, uh, a distorted economy that creates an uh, extreme dependency. Next, next slide, please. Um, and then just as a snapshot of the population statistics, so um, active duty military, including Coast Guard, 47,000 in uh, 2010, and with the dependents brings it all up to about 100,000 people, so almost a tenth of the population. Um, I don't have a more current figure than this, this one in the bottom, but so this was in 2000. At that time, if you added on the retired military, the total military connected population was almost 17%. And so Native Hawaiians at that time were about 20% of the population. So you have a situation where settler and military occupier are almost eclipsing the Native people. What does that do for cultural survival? Yes. Um, okay, and the cultural issues, um, uh, sites, sacred sites, burials, clashing paradigms of, of, about the land. Is it aina or is it property, real estate? And then. Um, the population transfer that exacerbates some of these problems. Next, next slide. So, military has what, how many golf courses, Terry? Yeah. Ten, ten golf courses in Hawaii. Because military golf courses, because golf is a national security priority. And this is one of their premier uh, golf courses on Mokapu Peninsula. Um, and that, those sand dunes are called the Heleloa sand dunes, and they're uh, a very important burial site. And so when the um, arm, I guess army built the airfield, yeah? Was it first the army that built the airfield? Not the marines, right? It's the army. The Navy or, or Navy built. This, this is in the National Historic Registry called the Burial. So um, further where those golf balls are in the background, there's an airfield, right? The main airfield in Mokapu. Um, that's where the Osprey might be coming if we don't stop them. That's where um, these planes and the Blue Angels and all that stuff was going on, the wall of fire. Um, they dug out over 2,000 human remains to build that airfield into the sand dune area. And they, they are in boxes in the Bishop Museum till today. And Terry and other folks have been working really hard to try to repatriate those Ivi Kupuna, um, but haven't been able to reach some kind of agreement with the Marine Corps. And so, you know, the, the violence happens like in the past and it continues to happen, right, on an ongoing basis, even like, like this scene right here, yeah. Um, how, how would people react if this was punch bowl? Yeah. Okay. And so, um, martial law, that was a really kind of interesting time that I don't, I, I have to study more, but you know, it's really radically changed stuff because the military sort of took power and took power away from the big five, 
the, the oligarchy. So it changed the economy, it changed the political system, but also made the entire islands into a kind of concentration camp. So this is, I, I don't know, somewhere downtown, they're putting barbed wire. Um, that was also when the military grabbed a lot of land in World War II. So there were executive orders issued by President Roosevelt. Mako Valley, Pohakaloa, all these places were taken. Some, in some cases, they were supposed to have been returned six months after World War II, but many of those in instances, Mako is still under military control. Yeah. Uh, next, next slide. And um, the militarization of youth and, and of our, our subjectivity, right, like who we are and how we identify, that was an active part of, of their thinking about how they're going to manage this majority of, of non-European you know, people in Hawaii that they didn't trust most of us, that you know, it was very threatening. And so the, the public education was a kind of a social engineering project for them. Um, the the gen commanding general Summerall, he was the head of the army in Hawaii in the 1920s. Um, Kamehameha schools instituted their junior ROTC program uh, several years before that. And they were the first in Hawaii to do so. So the Hawaiian school, right? McKinley High School was the second one. It was around this time that they instituted uh, Junior ROTC. And so he was being challenged by some of the racists who were saying, well, why do you want to train these people in our military? Why do you want to bring them in? So he was kind of the liberal answer. was like, no, what better way to ensure their loyalty than to incorporate them, to assimilate them, and to further the Americanization process. So I think we're still dealing with that, right? Junior ROTC was mandatory for boys in the public schools until, what, the 60s, I think? Something like that. They were still marching in Alamana Park and all of this. So, how many, you know, how many generations of our community have have been fed this information and these perspectives? Okay, next slide. Um, economics. Just, I just want to point out one, you know, kind of issue is that is how it creates these unfair um, um, economic situations. For example, with housing. M much of the housing in the military is not no longer. It's not like you live in government housing in barracks or homes or whatever. It's like a private company running it, so the government will give you an allowance based on your rank. You then can buy you know, or pay rent in the military housing on base through that private company or out in the private market. Right? So if you're getting a, a housing allowance of 2000 or 3000 a month, you could, almost, you could buy a house and pay your mortgage and all of that. Right? Realtors like that because it, it's going to artificially inflates and stabilizes the housing market. But if you're somebody who's trying to make ends meet on a service you know, economy job uh, and, and you don't have that extra bonus, uh, it's going to be that much harder. So I think, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that it's the direct cause of, of homelessness or the fact that people are moving away from Hawaii because it's so expensive, but I think it's a contributing factor in terms of how this military economy creates differentials right, between certain populations. Who gets paid and who pays the price? Next slide. Environmental impact, this is the whole lobby. Next one. Environmental justice, the contamination at Pearl Harbor. Don't eat the fish. Next slide. Uh, this is up in Schofield, uh, Lihue. Um, Army, uh, we asked them many times, do you guys use depleted uranium? And they said, no, we never used it. Then in 2005, we came across some documents that indicated they did uh, find depleted uranium in Schofield. And then it turned out it was also in Pohakaloa. So um, this is the radioactive, um, what do you call it, the radiation, what do they call that zone? Um, control hazard zone or something. There's like areas that are off limits or you have to go through with a uh, uh, radiation detector when you come out of it because they're afraid you're going to track this um, depleted uranium stuff in there. And they're still expanding in that area. Next slide. <coughs> Uh, this is kind of getting to what I was saying about the, the Americanization project that, of the military part of. But with the Japanese in Hawaii, it was particularly acute. And, and I think it, it accounts for some of our schizophrenic um, our relationship to the United States, to authority and, and military, and to a place like Hawaii. Um, on the one hand, we were enemy aliens all the way up to like, and through the war. right? And, and in many ways the, the reason why concentration camps were set up for Japanese during World War II was because of the fear of Japanese and Hawaii had so many of us. Um, but then we were given the carrot of 
become a, a patriot, become a super patriot, in fact. And you can, that's your way out. And so there was a really kind of stark contrast between the camp or the, the hero. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I think we still have that trauma in our community. I, I, I still don't think we've, we've kind of resolved what that has done to us and why we have so many contradictory positions around race and around, you know, issues about colonization and so forth. Uh, next, next slide, please. And so um, last year when Obama was in town for the APEC, he announced his new policy of the pivot to Asia and the Pacific. Um, and then he used this, um, the metaphor of uh, we are bound by the Pacific Ocean. Right? He's, sort of, he's sort of ripping it off of uh, what Pacific activists have been saying for a long time, but he uses it in a kind of a weird way. Um, next slide. So I want to just kind of remind us to go back to some of the thinking that um, helped build movements like the Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific and also the great um, Tongan scholar Epeli Haofa. Um, since we are the ocean, you know, we are the sea, and um, that the concept that the Pacific is are, are these small isolated islands was a colonial construct. Right? It was a way of, of, of uh, dividing and, and kind of shrinking the space for Pacific peoples. When in fact, the Pacific was this vast network of relationships, of currents, right, of ideas, of materials. Um, and so um, the, the colonial project carved it up into these, these little entities that I then forced to try to survive in the nation state system that was set up right after World War II. So in many ways the decolonization process kind of worked to um, imprison uh, the, the potentials of Pacific peoples to have a different way of living and, and having justice in the region. So um, I, I want to just kind of keep that vision in mind of Moana Nui, right? We had the Moana Nui conference here uh, last year as a way to counter the APEC vision, the neoliberal vision. Moana Nui as, a, as this network of relationships of this vast area that was uh, growing and becoming stronger as people connected. Next slide. And so I want to just talk a little bit about some of the resistance. Next, next one. Um, goes way back, 18, um, 1897, the Kuei petitions. Um, but you know, I'm going to jump ahead to next slide. Um, one of the seminal struggles is the Kaho'olawe movement. Uh, this picture is from this is the first step onto Kaho'olawe as part of that landing in 1976. That's Walter Reedy holding the boat ashore. The, the photo was by Ian Lin, who was on that uh, ship. They stopped the bombing. They, they um, took 10 years and spent $400 million, and only a tenth of the island is clean. So just keep that in mind. The island is about 28,000 acres. Okay, that's good. And then Makua Valley. So within a couple of weeks of the first demonstration at, at, at um, Kaho'olawe, there was a rally at Makua Beach. Uh, Kawai Puna Prejean was one of the organizers who moved between different communities. So he brought it to Makua and said, hey, we're going to do something for Kaho'olawe. So they had several hundred people on the beach and they went into the valley and um, somehow the guard shack made out of wood became a bonfire. Um, <laughs> but they, that was the beginning of this kind of, you know, weaving together of these different struggles. But there's um, many endangered species, most of it up in the ridges of the valley. Uh, residents were evicted and some of the stories are really heartbreaking. Uncle um, Walter Kamana, when, when he was still alive, testified at the hearing, you know, that the military came in and told us you, you had to move out and then they, they painted a white cross on our church and bombed it for target practice. So, so that church is still, or the, the remnants of it are still there, the cemetery is still there, you can go there and see it at Makua, but um, it's not a structure anymore. And the, and the community that was living there is gone. Um, and this is a place that was promised six months after the war is going to come back. So there have been several ways of effort to try to get it back. Next, next slide. Um, so, yeah, this is kind of what happens when bombs and the, this is the fire from 2007. It was um, about 2,000, 2,400 acres that burned. And this went across the street and it took out and it killed some endangered species too. Next slide. Um, so, just a quick timeline. There are many evictions but, um, uh, and protests. But in 1998, Malama Mapu sued the army. Uh, to force them to conduct an environmental impact statement. And through that, they, they, they were sort of able to tie up the Army's hands because the Army was failed to produce the environmental impact statement on time. 
And so the court issued an injunction that has prevented them from training, at least for the last, uh, I think it's eight years now. Next slide. Um, Pacific Missile Range. Kauai is getting hit really hard with um, the military buildup because of all the money that's going to the defense contractors who are doing um, space-based weapons, network-centric warfare, missile launches, and so forth. So they've, um, after September 11, they've, they've instituted much stricter security measures on the beaches. So some of the best surfing beaches right there, you have to get a pass to get in instead of going around. Next slide. And then the Striker Brigade was a, a, an expansion of the Army in Hawaii that came up around 2002, and many of us were involved in protesting and testifying against it. We held it up in court for several years, but ultimately the decision was already made that Hawaii was going to have its Striker Brigade. And part of that was, it, it wasn't all about military necessity, it was also about the, the who's going to get paid on this end by having all the construction projects that this um, expansion would bring. So the, there's always that push and pull that happens with the military projects in Hawaii. It's not just purely military um, design. And I'll give you another example. Is the Pacific Command Headquarters, a new uh, facility was built a few years ago. Senator Inouye appropriated money for it. The Pentagon didn't ask for that money. It wasn't in their budget request. The senator told them that you're going to want this and put the money in there so that they could have construction projects. So it's a way of putting in a lot of infrastructure that's going to sort of embed in the military in Hawaii for a long time and make it harder to push them to downsize. Next slide. Oh, and then, um, oh, okay, yeah, so, yeah, the striker one before that. Thanks. So, and, Around 2005, there was um, a student group called Kipuka was formed at UH and they filed a lawsuit against the army. Uh, this is a march we did from the palace to the federal courthouse. Um, these were a, a scene from one of the hearings where uh, they, they held a public um, environmental impact statement hearings on private property in order to prevent signs and other disruptions. Right? So several of us got arrested trying to bring our signs in because they're telling us you can't do that. So this was the second night of, of these arrests happening up at um, Helemano. Next, next slide. And then um, around that same time, there was a, this proposal emerged uh, that the University of Hawaii would form a classified research lab in partnership with the Navy. This would be a way to get uncompeted contracts from the Navy for um, weapons or re radar. I think they, what they envisioned was missile defense related testing on Kauai that would be f uh, flowed through the University of Hawaii through this, um, what they call the UR, University Affiliated Research Center. The idea was they, they don't have to compete, you don't have to write a proposal, it can just be put in the pipeline, it flows down to you, and then it's classified. So the, one of the issues was for a public university, which is supposed to produce public knowledge, right, increase our knowledge in general, how come the Navy gets to have this this proprietary knowledge that is um, off limits. And what are the ethical implications of doing research that could be resulting in wars and killing and other things? So we occupied the office uh, of uh, President McLean for a week, and we had many other uh, protests. The chancellor got fired. The new chancellor rejected the UARC, which was a great thing, and then um, they instituted it at the system level. <laughs> so they had to get their UARC no matter what. Even though we defeated it at Manoa, it went to the next level they just instituted it because it was, again, it's part of this, you know, push to get money to Hawaii at, at all costs. But it was a great, it was a great struggle because um, it brought together a really diverse coalition of students and community folks. And, you know, I think in some ways it helped some of us to think about how to work and create kipuka, little islands of resistance that, um, by our coming together and thinking different and practicing in different ways, we demonstrate and prefigure the kind of world we want to create. So we did that there. We took off our shoes and vacuumed and cleaned up. We said, we're going to show you how you take care of a place, not like how you guys do. So the recent threat that um, Terry and other, and Randy and other folks have been fighting is the proposal to bring Osprey and other um, new aircraft to Hawaii. Uh, the proposal is to station it at Kanyohe Marine Base, but it would be, it would, it would span the entire island chain from Kauai 
to Molokai, uh, Maui, uh, parts of Hawaii Island would be used as training areas or as emergency landing zones and so forth. So on uh, Molokai, folks uh, rose up and they, they built an ahu right in uh, Ho'olehua to say no we don't want it here and people, um, uh, they, they, they were protesting about the proposal to bring it into Kalau Papa, right? It's such a sacred place, it's such an important historical site. Um, so the, the Marines backed off of that particular proposal and they also backed off of um, station or doing training in um, North Kohala, the Uporu area. But the other sites are still on the table and they, they continue to move forward with their decision. Um, in, in Okinawa, the, the, the Osprey have just arrived and people were protesting furiously. 100,000 people came out to oppose the Osprey and uh, they've been blocking the gate and trying, trying to stop it from coming in, flying kites, <laughs> all kinds of creative stuff. But I, I heard that it just arrived uh, this week um, in, in Okinawa. So they're really upset and they're very interested in having conversations with us and with uh, folks in Colorado and New Mexico who are also fighting against the Osprey there. Um, so this is just a kind of a graphic to show all the red dots are countries with bases, um, the dark ones are countries with access agreements, and the yellowish green ones are um, with some sort of military cooperation. So it's estimated the U.S. has over a thousand uh, foreign military bases around the world. Next, next slide. And so the resistance has also been globalized too. So um, in Vieques, Puerto Rico, the first, the picture on the top right is from the 70s, I think. The fishermen were blocking the Navy ships and, um, you know, shooting them with slingshots. And, and the Navy was trying to fire uh, water cannons at them. They would go over the shallow reef with their boats, and um, the, the Navy ships would hit the reef and damage their propellers and rudders and all that. So they're, they're really creative and really fierce in their resistance. But at that time, in the 70s, Kahoolawe was also going on here. So PKO members went to Culebra and Vieques and had exchanges. So the solidarity was already starting to happen in the 70s. In 1999, uh, a bomb killed uh, a civilian worker, David Sanes, um, and it sparked a new wave of protests. Uh, Terry Kekoolani and I were on a delegation soon after those protests started. We went into the bombing range and met with many of the protest camp leaders and then helped to organize other folks from Hawaii to go there, from Kaholawe and other movements, um, so that we could you know, solidify our relationship with them. And it was a really inspiring movement, but here you see them tearing the Navy fence apart. Um, and, and they would always, every time there was a, a, a training, uh, people would, would get in by horseback, by sea, by cover of night, many ways to get into the bombing range as human shields. And, um, and disrupted the training so effectively that it became uh, a liability for the Navy and they eventually said forget it. The other thing that was really critical is they built a, a powerful network, a solidarity network among Puerto Ricans in the, in the you know, main cities where they're located but also in the Latino diaspora and communities in the U.S. So Chicano, Mexicanos and other Latin American um, communities came in support of Vieques. So that was a powerful block that helped to push the politics forward. And they stopped the bombing. In Okinawa, the picture on the right top is from that recent protest of 100,000. Um, the one on the bottom is over in another part of Okinawa called Hinoko, where they're proposing to build uh, a, a runway over a reef, a pristine reef area. It's a dugong habitat and fishing grounds. And so uh, when these rigs were set up to do drilling, uh, people occupied the rigs and blocked them for many months. Um, and they've been very successful at, at tying up the whole U.S.-Japan mutual defense treaty, which is really amazing. This little island has been messing with the whole geopolitical arrangement in East Asia, and so it shows the power that they have in there together. Next, next slide. Uh, in the Philippines, um, although the bases again were pushed out, uh, U.S. troops are again in Mindanao, and now they've recently signed agreements to open up access for Subic and Clark and other ports for occasional uh, military uh, cooperation and visits. Um, this is uh, the VFA, the Visiting Forces Agreement. That's the treaty that allows U.S. troops to come into the Philippines, and it has very unfair clauses that um, protect U.S. troops if they commit crimes in those countries. 
from the full application of the, of the law of those countries. So this is a feature of many of these um, base agreements. Um, next slide. Well, and, and some of the pictures have to do with troops that were um, accused of, um, of sexually assaulting uh, women in the Philippines. So the sexual assault prostitution issues are really big um, there. And then Ecuador, um, this was a, some scenes from protests there where they successfully got the U.S. base out of Manta, Ecuador. It was used for CIA and counter, counterinsurgency um, work in Colombia and, and um, to ostensibly to stop drug running. But um, the, the, the new president and the popular movement said, no, we, we had enough. And so uh, some of us went from Hawaii as part of an international conference against foreign military bases. And so soon after our, our gathering, the president declared that he was going to stop the, uh, not renew the treaty for the base. And so the U.S. is out of Manta base. And in Vicenza, Italy, um, U.S. is expanding an air base into this area near a, a town. Um, and so they've had a pretty intense struggle. I don't know the, the current status of it, but I think construction has begun and people have been uh, displaced, but they continue to, to organize. But here they took down part of the fence and they're carrying it through the streets. Next slide. And in Korea, um, the protester being beat is in uh, the Pyeongtaek village that I talked about earlier. Um, over on the bottom where the bombs are, that's a, a bombing range called Mehemri. And uh, they were successful in getting the, the U.S. out of that bombing range, but many people have suffered from accidents, getting shot or blown up by ordnance. In some cases, people committed suicide because the noise was just driving them crazy. Um, uh, so that area needs to be cleaned up. We, we visited there when we went. These two, uh, these portrait are two girls that were crushed by armored personnel carriers, U.S. Um, military vehicles in, in Korea, and so they become a symbol of the violence and the, the, the danger of the U.S. troops in Korea. And then the upper left is just uh, one of the many pictures of the Jeju struggle against a Navy base that uh, is destroying a very beautiful and um, vital uh, reef ecosystem and, and really incredible cultural sites. Um, so they were taken to the sea, they were climbing on, on cranes, um, all kinds of stuff, just relentless, fierce, 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 nonviolent resistance. Um, um, and um, uh, Kristen uh, was, was there um, as part of uh, a solidarity group, and so maybe, maybe you, you would like to share some, some of your stories, but it was a really amazing, um, it's a really an amazing struggle, and uh, we need to support uh, them very much. The, the other thing I wanted to say is that it's a Korean base, but it's being used by the U.S. as part of uh, its missile defense encirclement of China. So that's something that we have to keep in mind. Uh, next. Next slide. And in Guam, um, the relocation of troops from Okinawa would result in this, as I mentioned, this tremendous expansion of military um, in, in Guam. And so uh, there's been a, a growing movement um, to stop that. Um, now the new proposal is instead of 9,000 troops is to bring 4,700 um, and then spread the, the troops around. So 2,700 to Hawaii, 25. Uh, 2,700 in Hawaii, 2,500 to um, Australia, uh, new base agreements in Singapore and Thailand and many other places. So they're trying to spread, spread their risk around. Next slide, please. And in Australia, uh, that's Terry and Le Maile Kitemis at the bottom um, as part of a delegation that went to protest the talisman saber um, the, uh, exercises, during exercises. Next slide. And in Aotearoa, some activists went over, this is an NSA um, a spy facility in, in uh, New Zealand. And so they used a sickle and punctured the balloon. Uh, the, the mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, flat tire. And then in the Marshall Islands, uh, there have been efforts to build solidarity with them. The survivors of the nuclear tests are still suffering from the cancers. Um, and then the residents of, of, of Kwajalein who were displaced are still living in slum conditions. And so there's been efforts to try to build um, uh, support for them. Uh, and and there's a, there was a group called Eru um, of survivors that were both in Marshall Islands and in Hawaii trying to organize around those issues. The Bush administration refused to hear 
or renew um, compensation for the, the health effects of the testing. Next slide. And so, um, just in closing, I just want to um, refer to this quote from Atwood Makanani. He's a, he's a Hawaiian um, activist, a cultural practitioner, a voyager. Uh, he's been involved in the Kaho'olawe movement for a long time. And um, one day when we were driving out to Makua, he just kind of said, hey, we've got to go to this meeting. Right? And so I picked him up and we were driving out there. He said, you got a haku. I was like, I don't know what, you know, what do you mean by that? So haku is to braid or compose something, like a song or a chant, or to you know, braid a rope together. And so yeah, I, I, now I think I understand that he means that we need to braid our, we need to compose our story, our history. We need to bring our, our, the strands of our struggles together in a way that makes it stronger than its individual parts. And so that even how oceanic peoples can make these fibers that bind them, canoes together, that can sail across seas, that can erect structures and move logs through the mountain, through the forest, um, then let us weave our web of solidarity so they're strong enough to capture the big fish that threaten to eat us all. So, next, last slide. And um, to uh, give David Model the last word again, this is a, a, a prophecy that he recorded in one of his books. All that's above will be brought down, all that's below will be lifted up, the, the islands will be united, and the, the walls, the foundation will stand strong. So, thank you very much. question or two and we have plenty of time to um, anybody would like to have a comment or question I'm, I'm trying to live stream at the same time sorry um, I hear I hear a lot uh, one of the things I hear a lot about when when criticizing the military is that hey okay but if you didn't have the US military you'd have some other kind of uh, imperial expansion from some other imperialist uh, nation. What what is your response to that? I mean, imperialism is so 19th century. Yeah, are we beyond that? <laughs> I I, th I guess you know. I think we need to stretch our imaginations to a different kind of order that's that's just that's based on. on I, th I think this is where these networks can model how we can be in solidarity with each other and build a sense of peace and justice through those human relationships instead of through the force and coercion of, of arms. You know, that, that's, uh, I, I think that the kind of order that we have is violence. It's, it's, it's not, maybe it's not overt um, killings at all times, but it's a kind of violence that's inscribed into the relationships and into the domination and into the landscape, right? So that's part of why I think it's important to, you know, be talking, and I'm really thankful that Church of the Crossroads and is, is opening up this conversation. So we start to look at that. What is our responsibility? How do we be for know, uh, knowing these things? Kyle, I want to thank you very much for a brilliant pre presentation and bringing all the uh, uh, ramifications of solidarity together. As my wife, you probably know, my wife and I have worked long and, uh, with the Japanese anti-U.S. military uh, movement and uh, uh, the thought that the Hawaii movement is linking up with that now in the Osprey. I subscribe to um, a Japanese left magazine that sends me uh, periodically, regularly, the story against the Osprey. It really is centered in Japan right now, and the opposition in Okinawa is intense. We have followed that for years and years. We even went down to Okinawa once and linked arms around the U.S. base and so forth. So we've been part of it, and I just felt so uplifted by your account of the uh, linkages that are being made. And for instance, Ecuador now. One thing you didn't mention about Ecuador that just lifted my heart so is when people were saying, why are you expelling the base from Ecuador? He says, uh, well, what about Ecuador having a base in the United States? <laughs> and I, it was just so wonderful because, of course, the idea of an Ecuadorian base in the United States is absurd, right? 
Well, so he said, until Ecuador is allowed to have a base in the United States, we will then allow the United States to have a base in Ecuador. It's so simple, and yet it's so profound. And that type of uh, thought, you know, when it's circulated, gives us real strength. So once again, I want to thank you so much for what you did. I feel inspired to continue my work with guests who are secure. I always, I always worry when I do these talks because we're, we're, we're lifting the veil of, um, from so many, you know, myths that we imbibe. Um, it can be kind of depressing sometimes. <laughs> you know, I mean, I get, I get sort of overwhelmed when I think about sometimes what we face, but when I see these stories of struggle um, and successes, it's, it is always uplifting. Um, I think one thing I got from, from Vieques and some of these travels, um, we often think, think of resistance and, and protest as a kind of a last resort, like something you have to do because it's, it's, it's uh, otherwise something really bad is going to happen to you. And I think you know, what I saw was that it, was, it really was a productive aspect of their, of their community to then stand up and say, no, we have rights and we're going to assert them was a transformation that it changed their humanity of like who they saw themselves as, their place in the world, their rights, um, and, they, and they became, new opportunities emerged because they had that, that switch. Once they, once they stopped sort of believing that the power that exists is the way it has to be and that we just have to live with it, once they changed that thinking and they confronted that power, then they were changed and the opportunities opened up for them in different ways. So women started to organize um, as in Vieques, the um, Catholics, Protestants, and Evangelicals formed a coalition and worked together for the first time in many, many years. The political parties worked together and used, uh, formed their own organization. So all this productive energy comes out of that resistance. So it's not, it shouldn't be seen as a last resort. I think it's, it's like, it's just people standing up for their rights and exerting their humanity creates new things. It's a creative process. I'm from Guam, and uh, I just wanted to thank you that uh, this, of course, shows all the different places how we're all intertwined, and, and you on Facebook are very active, and it, to me, it really helps us to keep seeing every day, every day, people post on Facebook uh, all the information that they find out, and information really has helped us so much to progress, I think, you know, to really see when we were feeling so alone yeah it was a big big help when we found out that yeah everybody's trying to to get together on the same thing and uh, I love your um, use of the octopus I mean I, I yeah me too. I'm so sorry for the octopus no. but but, uh, but this thing you know about the how how the tentacles regrow and uh, I just read or heard some places today in the news about Vietnam they put the fence up again, oh, yeah. and uh, so that it just keeps going, keeps going. And when the woman from we're in Guam, uh, the one woman from Puerto Rico, uh, one of the questions I answer is, how, "How do you do it? How do you just? I mean, don't you get tired? I mean, how do you not?" And it's true what you say about how they've done it totally, or changed their attitude totally. She told me, "Oh, because you've got to get rid of that thinking, and you've got to know." This is a lifetime thing. It's it's for a lifetime. So none of this, you know, I'm gonna do this for 20 days or two months and then hopefully take a vacation. But no, and they seem to really live like that. So they they incorporated it into their whole family structure and made it into a positive thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I I really appreciate all you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments or, or conversation? I mean. I think there's a lot of experience in this room of people who've been doing stuff. Okinawa, South Verde, Guam, Jeju, Venezuela. Do we have add? Well, maybe I'll add, since you, uh, I don't know if I need it. First of all, mahalo, Kyle, because that was an excellent uh, presentation for all of us, you know, we lived here for so long, but it's true, we don't see how militarized our island is. We can't see it. 
Um, but I do want to say thank you. You know, we're a Hawaii Okinawa Alliance, so we've been networking with the people in Okinawa and their struggles for many years since the war. And um, I think the hope that comes out of these struggles is just that of the helping, that reaching out for humanity and that compassion. And when we saw, when, when I, you showed all the slides of around the world and the Pacific of these people's struggles, it really brings a different light to it because the, the people's will to fight for what they believe in, which is for, the, for humanity and their land and what they believe of, of their ancestors and what it means, it's just remarkable. So it brings us, it actually unites us. So tonight, even coming here and seeing that again and just seeing it all in pictures, Oh my gosh, wasn't that inspirational? Yeah. That was very inspirational because we are not struggling alone. Mm -hmm. And we are not, we're, we're also getting glimpses of, of lots of wins at the same time of how we can overcome and stay in the resistance for, for truth and for your rights. So thank you, because that was just uplifting. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you Good. very much. Thank you. Good. 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 I just want oh. like to add another word about Okinawa. Think about it. 1945, the war ended 67 years ago, and Okinawa has borne the brunt of the military occupation for 67 years. Finally, they are seeing the uh, release from that oppression, which has been intense. The amount of the land devoted to the military in Okinawa is greater than any place else in the world, I think. The whole island, you can't move around without seeing U.S. troops and U.S. installations everywhere. And yet, over 67 years, and I'm old enough to know, uh, I was 18 in 1945, <laughs> I'm going to be 86 in December, I followed that struggle, and ne never thinking that we succeed, we, I say we, the Japanese and the American who are opposed to it, would succeed. We haven't succeeded completely, I say we, but we're very close to it. Now, of course, it means they push it to Guam and to other places, right. but still, those people of Okinawa are having suffered 67 years, and they are finally seeing it. That's two or three generations. It really is tremendously inspiring. Thank you. And I think that's, you know, you, you, what you um, said is really true, is that the problem tends to get moved around to other places. And so that's why the solidarity was really important. I mean, I think right now uh, in Guam, you folks are doing really amazing work to bring Okinawa and Guam together so that it can be a not in my backyard type of a solution, right? Because yeah. that's that that's what people were saying, and you know, like, oh, go to America, go to Guam, go to Hawaii, right? I mean, that's how some of the Okinawans were talking. We had to we brought them here. We're like, no, look at what's happening. You know, you can't. This is this is. Um, we have to have a different solution than this. So um, yeah, I think I think it's and we've seen the fruits of that. You know, all this all this work. I think it's been really it's hard, but it's uh, worth it. Yeah, Doug, you want? Yes. Yeah, I had a. I don't know if I need a mic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm an old guy, and uh, it it seems like we've been doing this a long time. I've always proceeded in the belief that as as people find things out. You know, it brings people together because, you know, the people aren't unified because they just don't know all these things. So on the other hand, I've been doing it a long time and, and actually a lot of it right here at this church was also a center um, for activity back uh, many years ago doing uh, anti-Vietnam stuff. So my question is, from a historical point of view, is this the right road to go down? One and two is: Are there any new um, new forms of um, action in, in this kind of struggle? The right road, meaning to to continue to, to do continue to do this kind of thing, because it seems sometimes like I don't know what other choice there is. You know, I think we I think we a little a part of us a big part of us dies when we uh, succumb to. To systems that are oppressive and violent, like that. So, um, I, I think in order to live, we have to have a spirit of resistance and creativity and um, and love. You know, it has to be driven by love for humanity and for each other. Right? Those are the creative forces that um, I think uh, energize 
these movements and energizes me. You know, when I feel down, I have to look for that. Um, new forms. Um, you know, I don't know. I'm not a. I, I'm really. I kind of got into this work um, almost by accident, and um, I've never really theorized about movement building. But it seems that there are new ways that people are trying to come together that are not uh, based on hierarchies and uh, sort of, you know, centralized command. Um, people are figuring out that, you know, when, when you know the people and you trust the people that you're working with, you can create a very uh, uh, fertile environment for creative change to happen. And by linking up these things, um, these groupings, uh, we, we start to create a new society. Right? So it's, it's, it's a kind of a, a more of a network approach maybe. I think some of the Occupy movements have, have um, you know, again, theorizing about how that looks, and some of the um, World Social Forum and these glo anti-globalization movements are also talking about, well, you know, we can't have these monolithic sort of, you know, um, organizations that have marching orders and all that. People are doing different things, but we have to have affinities that bring us together. I, I think that, uh, at least that seems like a trend that is, has a lot of viability right now. I would like to thank you for <coughs> being the speaker this evening, putting it all together, this uh, uh, militarization, not only in Hawaii, but Pacific, the one-on-one, -on -one. because uh, many of the things that you presented, you know, I, aware, I was aware of it, but not into the depth as you were able to explain and, and to also to reason it out. Uh, because um, we, you know, grew up, all uh, some of us, you know, at the time here in Hawaii, accepting uh, the, uh, the military here as 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 part of the territory, as part of the state. But oftentimes uh, we have not questioned it. And uh, having uh, meetings like this, you know, is 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 a very important part to start really questioning uh, the uh, military in the United States, other countries, you know, in, uh, not only here in Hawaii, but uh, throughout the Pacific. And this is the reason why I think uh, Crossroads, I think, has been uh, out in the forefront, you know, for, for many years, questioning, bringing it to the attention of the people. That's the reason why, you know, we uh, helped to co-sponsor the uh, Moana Nui Conference when the APEC was here, uh, because uh, their agenda was saying that uh, uh, they could, <coughs> countries throughout the world, 22 countries that came here, could improve the uh, economies of the world uh, without questioning what are the environmental, what are the social and cultural impacts uh, in, in doing so. And the, and the same thing uh, that has uh, uh, <coughs> been going on uh, throughout the years, and this is what you brought out. You did talk about the, eco the economic, the cultural, the social impacts, and this is where the, the rest, you know, of the islanders uh, should become aware of this. And too bad that you know we didn't have more people here. But as as this this was a pre-event lecture uh, for the November uh, lectures where. Teresia Taylor will be speaking, and probably she'll be speaking primarily about the, the Pacific area, Fiji, uh, probably New Zealand, at, at, uh, where she comes from. But you have uh, also brought into focus the uh, the Hawaiian part of it, and we should not forget that. So uh, I'd like to encourage all of you uh, in November, you know, uh, to. Uh, to spread the word to others to attend the, uh, these lectures uh, that's coming up. And so thank you very much, Scott. Thank you.